thank you for joining. I just want to give it a couple minutes so more people can join the live section. Um, and if you have received our uh, crash course kit, make sure you bring out two of the fairness pitchers and the strainer. Um, we're going to brew the tea together so we can also taste the tea together. How's everyone? Hope you're doing okay. Right? And make sure uh, water is nearby and you have it uh, boiling as well. Right? Awesome. Um, so over here, I have uh, the tea called Guan Pian. So that's the session we're going to do today. So I'm also going to use Guan Pian as an example to go over green tea just a little bit as well. So um, I'm going to put, uh, put this tea now on a piece of paper. Um, so if you're at home, make sure you put the tea on a piece of paper as well, right? So for green yellow tea, we usually brew the tea with an uh, open vessel method. This way we do not cover the tea and we do not cook the tea because it is very tender. Um, for all of the uh, tasting sessions we're going to have, in case I forget to remind you every each time, just make sure you always save some tea leaves and you taste the tea leaves. And by the end of the session, you have a more intuitive understanding of why we uh, brew certain tea the certain way. Because regardless of the picking grade, which is not really uh, matters that much for the which brew method we adopt, it is actually the fermentation level of the tea determines why we brew a certain tea certain way. So make sure you taste all the teas. All right. I am going to um, pour the uh, one of the vessels with hot water. Okay. So feel free to do it with me. Um, we're going to smell the tea first. All right. So I'm just going back and forth to cool the water. Now for Guapian, which is the only green tea in China that use only leaves, no buds and no stems, because there's a little bit of a, a opening of the tea leaves, we are looking for a relatively low temperature, but not too low. For this particular one, I would say about 85 degrees Celsius is pretty good. So going back and forth for a few times can help cool the water down. And also serve the purpose of warming the vessel. Now this is a tea with a very grassy note. It has also been flash roasted, so it's kind of toasty as well. And now we're going to slide the tea um, into the vessel. Oh, taste the spent leaves. So after you brew the leaves, uh, just taste it every day. All right, I hope you can smell it. <laughs> So it's grassy, um, almost like a, you know how matcha is a little bit grassy. I also uh, would say among all the Chinese green teas, this is the tea that tastes most like a Japanese green tea. Uh, it's kind of grassy, it's a little bit toasty. Um, also, um, it has a, a little bit like a creaminess to it as well. And the tasting is going to come out even more. So this is Gua Pian, G-U-A-P-I-A-N. And when you pour the water in, just make sure you pour around the rim, not at the center of the tea. And the water level should also end up just at the neck. Yeah. Gua Pian, so it's the green tea. This is our uh, day one of the 10 uh, day crash course. So when, uh, if you haven't received the tea from us, it's the, uh, the G-U-A-P-I-A-N, the Gua Pian tea, yeah. Cool. The full schedule is also in the newsletter that Lori has sent, so uh, you can check uh, and get the teas prepared every day as well. All right. So now I'm going to let the tea brew for a little bit. Take a uh, pay attention to the level of the tea leaves, and um, you know I'm going to continue to talk, and then we can pour the tea out together. So Guapian is a green tea. Uh, now um, throughout the session, we're going to try. Uh, uh, eight distinctive styles of tea. But on the first level, there are six different categories of tea. So you have your green tea, yellow tea, white, oolong, red, and black. And remember, the Chinese red tea is the Western black tea, and we do have our own uh, black tea um, 
and you know we have we've had it for a while so it will not be fair for us to change the red tea to black tea but anyway um so green tea long story short is the tea that tastes the closest to a fresh tea leaves it maintains a lot of the tea's original taste it is also the tea that allows the among all the teas that's allowed to be a little bit bitter and um uh, to make green tea, a very critical step is the kill green step. It's basically you apply very high heat to the tea leaves and you kill all the enzymes in tea. And that's where you get the green tea. There's more uh, a lot of the details in the processing that ensures uh, a very different quality of the different green tea. But regardless, you have to adopt the kill green step. Uh, depends on the details in the in the processing method um, the we use for different green tea. There are also four subcategories of green tea. This is a, a style of green tea that belongs to the subcategory of Hong Qing or baked dry green tea. So just like the name suggests, it had been baked dry. So um, to make gua pian, by the way, gua pian means uh, sunflower seed. Uh, actually, it, it means sunflower seed piece. Um, it comes. The name gets uh, from the, the the shape of the raw leaf picking that because they have been destemmed, so it kind of look like a sunflower. Once the leaf opened up, we're going to take a look at the leaves, and you'll see why. Um, it's often mistranslated, however, as um, uh, melon seed. This has to do with the Chinese language. When you uh, combine melon and seed together, you get sunflower seed. Uh, if you add west before the word, so west or western melon seed, you get melon seed. Um, it's just a Chinese language thing. All right, so now the tea leaves have fallen a little bit. You can see it has occupied a little bit more uh, in the vessel than before. Now we can pour the tea out and just make sure you always leave some liquid with the tea. So you go around the strainer. All right, make sure you always leave enough water with the tea. You can return the uh, tea leaves that falls into the strainer into the fairness pitcher if you want. And now we pour it into the cup. Remember, pour it 70% full, okay? And we sip it. Hmm. So that very grassy vegetable note is what immediately comes out. Um, it's a very refreshing tea. But at the same time, notice how bold the body is this tea has, especially for a green tea, because green tea is not typically known for having a very full body. Um, I would assume this is must have to do with the terroir of this tea. Um, so Gua Pian is a green tea that comes from the Da Bian mountain range. Specifically, the Da Bian mountain range is a pretty large mountain range and there are three very famous Chinese uh, tea that come from this mountain range. The uh, uh, province that this tea comes from is called Anhui, even though the mountain range actually expands to uh, multiple uh, provinces. Now, uh, this one comes from a, uh, the true origin of a Gua Pian comes from a city called Lu'an, L-U-A-N. So even though it's written as Liu, L-I-U, but it's pronounced as L-U. So uh, that's why it's always L-U uh, and that's I and then uh, A-M. Now, uh, this sugary bold undertone is really what makes Gua Pian a very one of a kind in its mouthfeel in green tea. Sometimes we'll describe this as meaty or uh, oily, and these are actually the common terminology people will specifically use to describe uh, Gua Pian as well. Um, the first brew of the tea is mostly the um, uh, is mostly the aroma of the tea. But as you can see, this tea, for one, is because it has been destemmed. So when we pick guapian, you can only pick the leaf. You cannot pick any buds and not any stamps either. So it's actually very challenging to pick the tea. And because we do that, um, there's going to be a little cut or a little opening at the tea leaf with the tea leaves. So you have more color pigment getting steeped out. Usually you do not see the color green color pigment coming out from tea, but this one does. Um, 
So it has the most neon color out of all green teas that China has. And this is also what attributes to the, um, sorry, contribute to the, to the grassy note as well. All right. Because our time on the screen is limited, I'm trying to do all of this in half an hour. So uh, I'm not gonna finish all the tea. I'm going to put it in a cup, set it aside so I can drink it later. If you're uh, free to do the same at home, you can either drink it or you can dump it. I already had a lot of tea today. Right? And now I'm going to do the second brew. And remember for green tea, not only we're using the open vessel, but you always want to pour the water onto the wall of the vessel to make the tea swirl. Great. Um, so now the tea has occupied about half of the vessel. So it's mostly upward, but just like about half of the vessel. So that's pretty good as well. All right. So usually we say the second and the third brew for green yellow tea um, is represents most of the tea's true taste. So uh, in comparison to the first brew, the flavor is much fuller. Um, it's no longer uh, just the skimming the surface. It's no longer just pleasant, tender, but lack of depth. So this one is now, um, if this is the all the potential of the, imagine like almost like a color box, if this is the potential of the whole box, now every uh, pocket is being filled. Um, I also want to maybe grab a tea leaf and then uh, start showing you what we mean by picking only the leaves. So here, oh, this is a broken one. Here, there we go. All right, so C. This is a picking of Gua Pian. As you can see, uh, it has only leaves, and this is really the only green tea in China that has this star, uh, this style of picking. Um, it's not, so I want to point out, when people pick tea like this, it is not because they want to, uh, uh, they, they don't have, they, it's not like they already have picked the, the, the butt and then it's now the more inferior tea. People will actually purposely wait for this tea to uh, become more mature that you have a full leaf to pick. And then at the part where it connects to the uh, stem is also being de-stamped. It's very difficult to pick it this way. Uh, I would highly encourage everybody to go to our YouTube uh, channel and then look at the videos how people pick the tea. Uh, it'll, if you uh, uh, want to have a more um, you know, real demonstration of it. Uh, and this is the shape that's referring to the sunflower shape. Okay. Let's taste the tea. And so we're going to answer all the questions at the end because the, um, the distance with the screen and also my nearsightedness, I cannot really see the, uh, all the questions. I can only see things are coming up. So we'll save all the questions at the end. You can also utilize the question little mark, uh, little, little section to ask a question as well. Mm. Yeah, so you notice the tea is a little bit more tannic. Um, an awesome thing about Gua Pian, I would actually highly encourage everybody to do save your undrank Gua Pian uh, in the real time today. And what you can do later is you can shake it in the container vigorously and it will literally taste like a matcha latte. 
right? Um, so when you pick Huapian, you first pick just the leaves. Um, for the true origins, remember for all good tea, uh, that is always last being picked uh, region-wise or geographic-wise because it is colder. So the harvesting season for Huapian is actually mid to end of April. So it's a pretty cold tea region. That's when spring comes. And um, you pick the tea and then you do need to let the tea rest for a little bit. Uh, this is very important for making good green tea. Um, if you let the tea rest for a little bit, it'll convert some of the larger molecule of the uh, polyphenols into the smaller molecule ones. So basically you have improved uh, uh, texture and also this will change the ratio of the tannins with the amino acid in tea that'll give you uh, a more umami note in the tea as well. By the way, this tea, if you brew it uh, with a colder temperature, like how you do with the gyukuru, it actually tastes a little bit like a gyukuru as well. It's very, very mummy. So um, it's just we're not looking for that in drinking a Chinese green tea. We are looking for uh, a, a more full spectrum of the different tastes. So mummy is just one aspect of it. But if you do really dig umami notes, try to brew it a little bit differently and it'll bring out different notes in the tea. Anyway, so we uh, let the tea rest and... <coughs> Sorry, this depends on the weather, not coronavirus. Don't worry. Depends on the uh, the, the the different uh, uh, temperature and everything that you have. You can uh, either um, uh, let it rest for a few hours to uh, you know uh, up to like an hour. It really depends on the weather and everything. Um, and then the kill green step happens. Uh, for walking, people will actually do it in uh, like a little. Uh, they'll sit down and they have the walk, it's tilted, so it's kind of stand-up walk. And then people will use a little broom to do the tea. Back in the days, they even have a little bit, uh, a thing almost like a carpet beater to do the tea. And so they do not use hand. It's much, much more difficult to not use hand hand uh, to make tea because you lose your uh, sense of feeling and also um, it's just now you have to 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 teach a tool to listen to your brain to maneuver that uh, it's very tiring and um, all traditional Chinese tea, uh, green tea uh, up until very very recent are all wood fired so all the teas that we have are wood fired or charcoal fired um, uh, well, in the couple, uh, last couple of the years, people start to use uh, natural gas as well, but usually it's, uh, it's wood fired. And uh, so people usually have three different walks, and the three different walks, even though in uh, two to three walks, but three walks will be the ma uh, will be the most ideal uh, and efficient. So uh, even though they all look the same, but they actually have different temperature. So the first walk you will uh, basically respond. It has the highest temperature and the responsible for uh, killing all the enzymes in the tea. And then the second walk is for making the shapes. You adopt a rolling motion, and this is what makes the guapim curl up. And then the third uh, walk is to ensure that. And then afterwards, the tea is taken off the walk, is sift. All traditional Chinese tea needs to go through rounds and rounds of uh, refining process. So it's then shift, uh, sifted, and then after it's being sifted, you can then, uh, or sorted, you can then put the tea on the baking tray uh, to uh, let it bake dry. And this takes a much longer time. It can take hours at a time. And then the baking is always using charcoal. And then at the end of the uh the, the 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 day and so this is already uh past midnight so you're looking at uh, uh like early mornings and long nights and things like that and so um uh you can then uh bake the tea dry again it's usually twice baked to make sure it's dry dry so now the tea seems it's already dried but it's not uh, so you're gonna let the tea kind of uh, just rest for a few days and it'll start to feel not crispy anymore and uh, You then take the tea out and you bake it dry again, and this is called pulling the small fire um, And then after that you let the tea rest again and then uh, this depends on the weather. It can take uh, up to a week, three, four days, a week. Um, and then you take the tea out again. And then this is the signature step of tea of the Luan region. Is where you put uh, about 20 pounds of the tea. Uh, you, can, you can do it with different batches. But for Guapian, it's about 20 pounds of uh, the tea onto the baking tray. And you have uh, two people to uh, repeatedly walk this tray of tea over a charcoal bonfire. It's very, very hot. We have pictures and um, uh, 
our website and we have videos on YouTube. So take a look to get a more uh, intuitive understanding of what it is. Uh, so what happens is this is a very, very risky step. And in making all good teas, we keep looking for risky thresholds. Uh, but this step is very necessary to solidify all the notes in tea. And this is what gives you such a concentrated feeling of the tea. And it also repels any impurities as well. And it enhances the aroma as well. Uh, so without these steps, these are the finding steps. So without the finding steps, the tea really is not fine tea. I think by this point, we all know most of the tea that's called fine tea or premium teas are neither. Um, so it needs to go through all these finding um, finding process and um, uh, so along the way we keep sorting and sifting the tea so with 20 pounds of tea you really just end up with like about 12 13 pounds of the the final tea um, now um, a days majority of the guapian are all made with machines it's very a uh, few handmade guapian in the market anymore uh, this one comes from the uh, most sought after village called Qishan. Uh let's have more of the tea I'm actually going to uh, pour the tea out again so we can move on to the third brew. So with the third brew, the tea will open up even more and it has more of that sugary undertone, the creaminess. Uh, just as a reminder again, not only you want to uh, chew on the tea leaves a little bit, uh, at the end, but also make sure you save some tea, put it in a bottle or something and shake it and then drink it later. It tastes like a, a, a matcha latte. All right. So see now, this tea has occupied the fullness of the pitcher. And that's what we uh, what we want with the third brew. This is to show yourself that you have to brew the tea correctly. So brewing the tea is to getting to know the tea and then you know, you can predict how the tea is, is going to react with uh, each brew and it was different temperature, different time, things like that. And this is what happens. It should be occupying the full vessel. We're gonna pour it around, but make sure you save some water. Always, always save some water. So um, let's talk a little bit about location. So for all traditional Chinese teas, I mean, for all Chinese teas, basically, location is always the key because location demands the price, right? Um, and the three key factors, location, varietal, and processing. Varietal and processing, even though uh, it seems to be separate factors from location, but it just given the best location, you just have the uh, greatest uh, opportunity to also have uh, the most desired varietal and have the people with the most experience with the processing. So it kind of, even though it's separate, but it has a high correlation, it kind of goes with this, it goes with the location as a whole package. Now for any historic location, um, you always have the broadest uh, location to be attached with the name. So this tea called Guapian, instead of just calling it Guapian, in China we will usually call it Luan Guapian to refer it to the true origin or the, uh, you can consider almost like the AOC for this tea, but it's really the maximum you can have, right? So, so, so it needs to be at least come from the city of Luan to be called a Luan Guapian. And Luan is a city which is a pretty uh, big region. Now, uh, so within the city, within any true origin, the, the Toar is then also separated into the inner mountain and outer mountain. You can consider this almost the equivalent of like the Grand Curran and the uh, the Premier Cru. So, so within the inner mountain, obviously this is more precious, uh, there will be numerous jurisdiction villages that are ranked and have different hierarchy and therefore demand different prices for the tea. And within the, um, the, the inner mountain, uh, the most prized jurisdiction village is a village called Qishan, uh, which is, has, is labeled on the package of the tea that you can see. And within Qishan, uh, which is a jurisdiction village, there are n uh, several natural villages as well. There's actually one natural village also called Qishan, and that is the natural village that is really the crown jewel of them all. All right, so so this particular uh, uh, Huapian comes from Qishan. And varietal. So you can have, let's have this third brew. 
So now the tea has opened up even more, and I can uh, I definitely feel uh, the buttery mouth feel of this tea, right? The aroma keeps abating, but the buttery mouth feel start to stand out even more. All right. So, um, varietal now or the cultivars that we use for this tea. Um, for all traditional tea region, the most desired cultivars you want to use are basically the indigenous varieties of the region. Um, it's not single, uh, it's not singleized yet, so it basically is um, heirloom. And uh, by definition, every single tea tree is a little bit different. Uh, the Chinese uh, terminology we call them group of varieties because they're a, you know a group of them is not a single one. And the group varieties uh, provides the most complexity and the potential of the tea, so it gives the tea maker more uh, flavors to work with, right? Um, but the flavors are, 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 are random. The tea maker's job is to make sure that they're distributed in a uh, aesthetically appeasing way to our palate, so they organize in such a way, and that's the magic of tea making. So um, the region, for any given tea region though, the majority of the tea still comes from clones. Uh, the most common clone for this particular region, for Guapian, is called Wu Niu Sao. Um, and they usually harvest very early. It starts to harvest at the beginning of April. So uh, in the true origin. So if it's in the surrounding region, it does not even, uh, it's even earlier than that. So if you ever had a guapian that come out at the beginning of April, it's definitely not this one. Um, <clears throat> so uh, this is the ben cha. So ben cha is the terminology the, uh, the locals use to describe their indigenous varieties, the heirloom cultivar, the heirloom varietal. So, uh, so this is a, a ben cha, and it offers a, the, the more authentic taste of what made the tea the, uh, famous in the first place. Because Luan is actually a very ancient tea region, it's what we call a thousand year old tea region. Uh, but keep in mind, the style of this particular tea did not come around until uh, more recently. It only has a, uh, a little bit over a hundred year history, so it's not, uh, it's not as ancient as the tea region. But what it really is, is that it means that for generations, no matter what tea uh, that generation of tea drinkers preferred, the tea region is, demand, uh, is, is considered as a really, really good tea region for producing the tea. Uh, and I already spent a lot of time at the beginning to describe the processing of this tea. So now, for any given tea, you always want to consider what is the location, and it needs to be very, very, very specific, okay? To say that this tea comes from Anhui province is the equivalent of saying this wine comes from France. It does not provide any details, it means nothing. Um, even the city is not enough. Uh, but if you're able to identify that this is a, a tea that comes from the true origin instead of coming from the surrounding area, uh, that's it's a pretty good start. But then within that, you want to know if it's from the inner mountain or the outer mountain. And then if you are able to get to the inner mountain, then you're supposed to be at the this stage of tea learning where you uh, either memorize or have access to a full list of the uh, different uh, appellations within this uh, inner mountain and then know their ranking, their higher the different prices they demand, the different characteristics, and then uh, if you're able to narrow it down to the crown jewel of them all, which in this case is Qishan, that'll be even more awesome. And then in terms of cultivar variety, of course, it's very important to ask, right? You, if you have a bottle of champagne, you want to know, was it, uh, you know, uh, made from Chardonnay or was it made from uh, Pinot Noir? So, so these kind of things uh, are kind of things that kind of matters for a tea connoisseur. Uh, so for this one, it's an heirloom varietal. And then also the processing, kind of want to know what details ha uh, happened and what details uh, were missed. Uh, and this is one that we made in the most traditional way possible. It's completely handmade. There was no machine or anything at all. And I want you to remember the taste of this tea. Wow, it tastes very sugary now too. This the sugary undertone is definitely what uh, tea that comes from this particular region um, has in their characteristics because the other two uh, famous tea that come from this mountain range also have a similar trait even though they're processed completely differently. 
And now to finish up, I just want to show you how we brew the last brew the tea so you can see how we uh, finish and where the tea's position is. And at home, if you drink the last brew, the tea is going to taste a lot more vegetal. Uh, the tea, the spent tea leaves will smell a little bit grassy, but mostly vegetable and should always finish very clean and will not have any kind of funky taste, uh, things like that, or funky aroma. And if you attended our brewing class, I hope this is a good refreshing uh, course for you so uh, you know, you're getting the result that you want at home. And then for the last brew, we usually do let the tea uh, steep for a little longer. Yeah. And if you are not able to make guapian swirl, don't worry. Guapian is a little bit more challenging to swirl than the yuhu that we have used during the, uh, the brewing course. All right. So we can let it wait for a little bit for the tea to drop down. But now I think it'd be good to uh, take questions. So uh, let me go grab the phone and then so I can bring it closer to me. Give me a second. Uh, all right, so if you have questions, please let me know water should be boiling or what temperature? All right, so um, I always start with boiling temperature, but for this particular tea, I would give it about um, uh, 85 degrees Celsius given the weather I'm in now, which is uh, pretty comfortable indoors. Um, depends on, because remember, we're letting time pass by as we brew the tea. And because of that, you always want to consider the end temperature. So if it's really, really cold uh, where you are, then um, you might want to adjust the temperature a little bit higher because it's going to, temperature is going to decrease at a higher, uh, a faster rate than uh, where I'm at. Uh, I always start with boiling because uh, my sense with the temperature is much better when I start with boiling and let it cool down. Um, if I don't do that the other way around, I feel like I don't have a good grasp on the temperature. And also weighing down, remember, we always use higher temperature, not lower temperature, because with higher temperature, you can always take it out um, uh, faster. But if you use uh, lower temperature, you're just stuck. Oh, if you like guapian, what other green teas uh, should you try? So guapian's taste is very, very unique in Chinese green tea. Depends on what you like about guapian. If you like the grassy aspect of it, the only Chinese very grassy green tea I can think of um, is actually a um, a green tea that's it's not very common in the in the states. It is not considered first tier historically famous tea in China either. Called Yunxi Huoqing. Uh, I doubt you'll find it here though. Uh, that one is also a little bit grassy. Uh, a lot of Japanese green tea definitely has the grassy aspect of it. But if you like um, uh, the toasty note of the green tea, uh, I would say uh, some of the classic Chinese nutty green tea like a Longjing would definitely satisfy that. Um, if you are craving for the sugary, uh, thick, uh, buttery undertone, I would recommend Maojian. But just keep in mind, the, 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 the front notes of Maotian is very different from Guapian. Um, it's sharp, it's, uh, um, it's upward, it's very, very different. It's also a little bit nuttier as well, but the sugary undertone is still there. All right. Can you tell me how much water we'll be using each day so we don't have much to boil? Come on here. So the kettle I have is, uh, I think it's one liter. Uh, so that's enough for me to, to use. It's the Bonavita uh, kettle. It's the most basic uh, kind they produce, uh, the most basic electric one they could produce. So it's about that much. Uh, so each one of this has about 10.5 ounce of water when we fill it up to the neck. So if we do four brews, that'll be uh, about 42 ounce of liquid. So at least have that much uh, ready for uh, uh, before each session. Why didn't you brew the tea for longer the first? Uh, so we did brew the first brew longer 
The second brew and the third brew, we didn't want to brew it for longer because um, uh, the tea has already, I mean, it, it was not, not long, but it was long enough for the brews. So uh, basically just uh, less than a minute and that's enough for the tea. And if you have let the tea sit for longer at home, uh, like uh, in our normal days, you know, we wouldn't drink tea as fast as we have uh, represent, presented on the video today. So what's going to happen is uh, you don't need to let the tea sit for very long because the tea has already sitting in the water and had opened up um, um, no straining does not change the mouthfeel because um, the mouthfeel comes from the uh, the tannins in the tea and uh, in general the the size of the strainer does not re cannot really filter the the catechin Um, to swirl the tea leaves, it really depends on how realistically you can do so. So for green yellow tea, it's kind of necessary. You get judged by your uh, by your peers with your brewing. If you're able to make the tea swirl, that's kind of uh, like the basic. You had to do that. Uh, for all the other teas, especially with Gaiwan, uh, if you with oolong, you know there's so much tea in the in the gaiwan. It's so heavy; it's almost impossible to make the tea swirl. But if you have white tea and things like that, if you are able to, you can make the tea swirl this way instead of this way. So that'll work too. Uh, sure. I'll I can write down the name of the the cultivar in just a second. Um, and the type of the water we use uh, at the tea house is uh. Uh, it's, a, it's a filter water, so it's New York City water first, and then we filter it. Uh, New York City water comes from uh, Caskill, and we, we work with a local water, water store. Uh, they're no longer there, but uh, they're very nice folks, and then uh, we did a couple rounds of water tasting, and we tasted many different kinds of water. We eventually set it down on this filter. It basically filter out uh, like the whatever the government adds to the water, so it kind of revert the water back to Caskill water, and it's very good. Uh, what does it mean by clone? So, uh, so basically means that the varietal has been stabilized. So it was not, uh, there's not a mother tree and a father tree and it got married and it had a seed. So you take the sapling from a tree uh, and people usually do that in a, a controlled environment. So you have many, many, many saplings and then you just plant the saplings. Yeah, so it's the varietal stabilized. It's not, um, I don't know what's called in English, but in Chinese it means uh, there's no sex happen between the plants. Oh, <laughs> cool. Yeah, maybe we'll have a uh, uh in the word uh, brew the tea longer. Oh, why do we not brew the tea longer the first few times? Um, I did brew it for kind of long for the first brew, and then the second and third brew was um less than a minute, but still it was uh. Uh, like a few seconds and stuff. So you want to always look at how much the tea has sank down instead of just going with the time. And that was enough for the tea as well. And if you uh, brew the tea at home and the tea has been sitting there for a while before you do move on to the next brew, you can even pour the tea out right away. This is just for green yellow tea. Hand picking journal is still better than machine. Uh, of course, especially uh, for the better tea. So right now, so hand, uh, there are two aspects to hand making, picking versus machine picking. Uh, so so one thing about hand picking is also the uh, uh, the yield. So hand picking is better for the tea tree, and it provides us with better yield. So uh, because of that, the combined factor is also a suggestion of how valuable the raw leaves are. Because of the tea is very valuable, the farmers is un very unlikely to be willing to do so if you to 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 have the tea picked by machine because we're wasting a lot of tea. Um, and also, uh, hand picking obviously it's more careful attention paid to each tea. It's better for the tea, uh, and then for certain tea, for like guapian, it's impossible to pick by machine. There's no machine that can pick just the leaves. It'll your um, subsequent uh, work to sort out the the desired tea is gonna be daunting if you didn't do that in the first place. All right. Yes, we do not use closed vessels to brew Chinese green tea. Do not use a guy one to brew Chinese green tea. Uh, all right, do you look for in terms of uh, taste with zero versus two three. Right, so um, 
A green tea has a highest, so for all tea, you always have the risk of oxidation. Oxidation change uh, how the tea originally tasted. Um, and I want to point out that uh, ox with oxidation, a lot of times the, tea, the taste of the tea actually have would run out, and it sometimes it makes certain tea become more drinkable. But uh, in general, it's not considered desirable. With green yellow tea, as time goes by, you have a higher risk of oxidation. If you keep the tea really well, uh, it doesn't really uh, you can you can mitigate this risk basically. So as the tea oxidizes, um, it'll become a little bit sweeter. And, uh, it'll become a little bit less complex because a lot of the tannins have been running out as well. So, so that's the main aspect of the tea with oxidation. So also like that's a inherent risk you're going to have with the tea uh, going through a longer period of time. Uh, you don't need to brew older green tea at a lower temperature. Yeah. Um, Uh, um, well, I think it depends on, so somebody uh, asked, you know, about purchasing, if you don't uh, have uh, money for super uh, fine tea, what do you do? Um, well, that really is a, is a choice of your own. Uh, I mean, it's, I don't know what to, what to say about that, right? So you basically, you uh, you can, you can, you can, you know, if you love tea so much, right? Uh, like there are circumstances where I just prefer tea. Sometimes I go to a hotel, a rural hotel in China. They have those complimentary tea and I don't have anything on me. So uh, I'd rather drink that tea than no tea. So I would just do it anyway. So it really depends on, you know, just, uh, it's, it's like, it's a, everybody's individual decision on what you want to spend on tea uh, or on anything really. Yeah. Why second brew is better? So because the second brew, the tea has opened up more. It has, so brewing is really a continuation of the vision that the tea maker has. And what the vision the tea maker has in best practice should really be to fully realize the potential of the tea. So let's just say if the tea, uh, the full potential of the tea, the tea is uh, wants to give you uh, uh, 10 different elements in the taste. It tickles full of your mouth. The first brew, the tea hasn't really opened up yet, even though it's pleasant, but it doesn't hit all these uh, parts yet. It doesn't It doesn't give you the full picture of the tea is able to do yet. And in the middle brews, the tea will have more, uh, will have fulfilled more of this potential. That's why it's considered better. Uh, I would say if you only like the first brew of the tea, it's almost like uh, you only like uh, how you, when you first meet a person, right? Uh, but you probably don't uh, really like the person if you had to spend like more than two hours with the person kind of thing. Uh, so the tea is the same thing. You might like uh, the true taste of a different tea, but only the, the surface of uh, this particular tea. All right, let me see uh, more questions. Caffeine have uh, so guanpian, I would say, is a green tea that can make you feel a little bit more caffeinated. Now, caffeine is not something that is very easy to uh, pinpoint. Uh, however, uh, the rule of thumb is basically uh, caffeine is bitter. So if the tea is more bitter, you can assume it has a little bit more uh, caffeine or make, make you feel a little bit more caffeinated. Yes, if the tea didn't sink to the bottom, you can always make more brews out of the tea. Also keep in mind, if you brew the tea at home for yourself, feel free to do it however you want. Uh, even just for the sake of finding out more about the tea, right? You give it pressure and you're just like, I just really want to know what can this tea do. Um, and there are certain tastes in tea that we do not desire, such as uh, if the tea is over, uh, like if you over extract the tea well past the tea's potential, sometimes uh, the vegetable note in the tea is so strong uh, that we do not desire it. But if you, that's a taste you particularly like, then like that, right? But you always had to leave. So um, uh, this goes back to that uh, green yellow tea has a higher tendency to uh, oxidize. So just like you're cutting potatoes and then soak the potatoes in water. So you always want to uh, uh, soak the green yellow tea in water to prevent the tea from oxidizing.
all right and then also um uh if you go to china people uh more likely would drink the tea directly out of the glass they uh brew the tea in so for green yellow tea uh so they just sip on the tea with no filter so you have to deal with tea leaves falling to your mouth and it's not sh shared um, so usually uh, it's customary to always leave a little water with the tea as well. Uh, oftentimes whoever uh, serve you the tea, they will remind you uh, and then they will say something like this. They will say, if you drink the tea, uh, the tea will uh, will die or you'll kill the tea. So so, so don't get uh, surprised if these such terminologies are, are used. If you drink the tea, tea will die, things like that. Uh, yes, so so tea bags uh, definitely you know um, right now it I would say it's not tea bags fault. It's just given the current uh, tea world that we're in, um, the tea that's in the tea bag usually are not very good. But tea bag itself, I think, is a great invention. You know, uh, I actually have uh, those uh, uh, like tea bags that you can put tea in. So if I have you know the last part of the the tin which is very dusty, the tea, uh, I will put it in the tea bag and then drink it like that. Uh, so tea bag. I think it's a great invention but yeah currently if you just buy the tea off the shelf that the tea that's inside the tea bag probably is is not very good oh oh because I wasn't didn't want to pour the tea on the screen I wanted to proceed to the answering but feel free to pour your fourth brew out I mentioned it in the in the video earlier so just uh, feel free to pour the fourth brew out and you can um, and enjoy the tea at your own pace. Uh, but even if the tea is still steeping, usually it's fine, especially if you control the temperature really well, because eventually you reach this equilibrium and the, the brewing will actually drastically slow down and it will not over extract the tea. We need a different teaware for each tea variety. Uh, no, you don't need to do that. If you use teapot, uh, in a way, yes, because the shape of the teapot actually does impact uh, how uh, the the temperature inside of the the teaware works. So so that's why um, using teapot, even though it's uh, more convenient for the brewing, but it's actually more complicated in uh in 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 to because it's more limiting basically on our ability to maneuver the tea so it's actually more challenging if you want the same result using teapot uh usually i would say you have to use the teapot to fit the tea so different size different uh height different shape of the teapot to fit different style of tea and if you use teapot as unglazed which means it'll actually uh take the stain and the, it'll take the residue from the tea and develop on the teaware then uh then yet yes you probably want to use a different teaware for each different tea just because of the residue so there are two different uh things about teapot How should you store green tea? So um, <clears throat> at home, I would actually uh, encourage people to store green tea uh, in a uh, uh, refrigerator is fine. Um, I do not want to uh, encourage, if you are selling tea, do not do that because if you store the tea in a freezer or refrigerator, uh, when the tea is taken out and then the customer take it home, uh, it's gonna have a problem with condensation, which is a much, much, bigger problem than oxidation. Um, so uh, and you just do not want this kind of uh, fallout of expectation uh, your customer have once they have the tea home and it has condensation. So, uh, but if you have tea at home, because it means that you're only gonna take out the tea to drink for that run round, uh, you wouldn't even have uh, enough time for the tea to develop this problem condensation. It's actually a very good method to store green tea. It'll take the, it'll, it'll, it'll add at least a year, a, a lot, a year uh, longer to keep the freshness of the, uh, of the green tea. But uh, in household though, usually you have other things in the refrigerator. So uh, unless you can dedicate a section just for tea storage, uh, sometimes the aroma of your, 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 your groceries in the refrigerator can also interfere with desirability of the tea. So these are the factors you want to consider. But uh, in general, yes, uh, keeping tea at a very low temperature is very good to uh, prevent uh, oxidation. 
Um, using a gaiwan is definitely more universal. I always say gaiwan teapot is like um, so teapot is like an automatic car and gaiwan is like a manual car. For the most part, they do the same thing. Um, but with a gaiwan, it's uh, you have a little bit more maneuverability and also uh, you invest a little bit effort in learning how to use the gaiwan at the beginning, and then uh, it's so much easier to clean. Uh, it's so easy to maintain, so easy to clean. Um, it's just for people who folk have more, a greater focus on the drinking tea itself. Um, I think it's just a much better solution. Yeah, it's almost like, uh, do you want to keep a whole bunch of very complicated uh, appliances around, or do you want to just have a really, really awesome cast iron wok that is you see you, you can use for anything? It's really just that kind of question uh, for you know one's decision on cookware. I'm getting authentic, but right uh, yeah, the bug bite tea is a big, big problem. Uh, many years ago, uh, I actually had this discussion with a scientist in uh, Taiwan, and he uh, was <laughs> voicing his concerns as well. He was so confused that how um, you know that particular kind of pest. Uh, that's supposed to give the tea bug bite. Uh, they are a big problem in. Um, they're really a pest, right? It's a very big problem um, uh, in the in the in the tea agri agriculture, and then uh, to uh, people try to prevent it and things like that. So it's very difficult to control a pest. Uh, so how? People not only they're able to control the pest, but uh, these bugs are able to bite the tea leaves just at the right time, extract just the right amount of juice, and leave the tea without causing an actual uh, problem. That year is uh, is really outside of uh, a scientist's understanding. So because of that, I'm very suspicious of the authenticity of all bug bite tea. Uh, yeah, you don't want to use a guy one for green and yellow tea, um, but play around with it though. And you notice why. Uh, so basically, the tea will oxidize very quickly, and also if you cover the tea, it'll change the flavor of the tea. Remember, when you do this at home, right? You can do it without anybody's judgment, and then you should always do this, do these things, and to just experiment, uh, and then see the difference and then understand why we don't use the gaiwan to brew green and yellow tea. Um, I, I brew green and yellow tea with the gaiwan for uh, these reasons. Uh, one is if I don't have the option of a closed vessel, right? So you can always, you know, improvise and use a gaiwan, just don't put the lid on. And secondly, it'll be um, uh, sometimes I, I really need to wake up or uh, help somebody to wake up, I will concentrate, I'll pack a lot of tea in the green and yellow tea in the gaiwan, uh, and I flash brew it very quickly. So if I do it really fast, if I finish drinking tea really fast, it, I can also using time alone to mitigate the risk of oxidation, right? Uh, and it produce very concentrated green and yellow tea, and it's, uh, it's a different kind of taste, and it gives you a different kind of satisfaction. I don't know, it's just like, you know, it's like a green, brew tea is very much like cooking. Sometimes you change things around, experience a little bit uh, it give you a kick um, even though that's not your preferred everyday method but you do that once in a while uh, do you truly have different timings um, Yes and no, because time is not a standalone factor. It has to do with the water to tea ratio and also has to do with temperature. And temperature is not just the temperature of the water that goes into the vessel before you brew the tea. It's also the temperature of the water while the tea is brewing at the point when you pour it out. So which has a lot to do with the surrounding temperature, right? Is it in the winter? Is it in the summer? Is it is AC blasting? Things like that. So uh, because of all those, it'll all change the time. That's why we usually don't go with time. We go with how much the tea has opened up. Mm, I know that. Um, I, I actually really do not... Uh, uh, do not drink tea when I don't feel very well um, because tea not only it's not only because tea is not medicine but in China uh, the c c culturally uh, we're also advised to not drink tea uh, when you're not feeling well just because tea is even though it's it's gentle it's not a medicine but it's also not neutral either so you kind of do not want to uh, alter the 
uh, alter the, the, the your body condition and we will go with either actual herbs or um, <clears throat> The best advice uh, a Chinese doctor usually give you is actually to just uh, stay as neutral as possible. So we will uh, eat things that's not very salty, not um, uh, stimulates you too much, you know, not very spicy, things like that. And then tea kind of falls uh, in line with something that will still alter your body condition a little bit. So we were usually just advised to drink hot water. Uh, unless you know specifically, you know, if I have a cold, I'll probably have some um, uh, ginger uh, right, even if I'm uh, feeling very uh, heat up, sometimes I will boil some pear to drink things like that. Yeah, but I usually wouldn't drink just tea. Yeah. Uh, which are other major tea right I will consider want to learn more about green tea. Oh, there are many uh, different kinds. So, um, uh, well, I would say a great resource is actually uh, you can go to T Trump's website and then see these are the those are all the list of the um, historically famous green teas. Um, it's not. Uh, it does not include all historically famous green teas, but uh, it's a good start. Yeah, and but all the ones on there are historically famous green teas. It just does not include all of them. Okay. Uh, so teaching for pregnant people. Um, I have never been pregnant my whole life, so I actually also don't cannot speak anything from my personal experience. But I do know in China, um, keeping things warm is usually recommended for female in all aspects. So drinking warm water, um, uh, uh, having like a, um, a, a black sugar uh, or like the you know the brown sugar things like that is usually recommended. Uh, so in that aspect, red tea is always recommended for female, uh, just because it's supposed to move your blood circulation a little bit better. Um, but I also know that caffeine is a big consideration you want to factor in uh, when dealing with pregnancy. So I actually do not know. I don't think in China there's specific. You might need to ask an actual Chinese doctor uh, uh, about like tea drinking in uh, pregnancy. But I wouldn't think green tea might be too in just conventional wisdom <clears throat> tell us uh that drinking green tea might be too cold for uh, a body condition that needs to be kept warm Uh, yes, I definitely recommend to not drink uh, not drink any tea on an empty stomach. Uh, there are certain teas, if it's a very well-made red tea, it's uh, less uh, tannic and it's kind of sweet, so you might feel less discomfort drinking uh, on an empty stomach. But the thing is, uh, tea is excellent. Tea is basic, basically. So you um, it'll kind of not sit very well with your stomach uh, acid when it's on an empty stomach. So I would definitely recommend, if you can, uh, drink tea uh, with food in there. Also, you're gonna get so hungry and you get tea drunk very easily, so that's also not recommended. About caffeine kind of each variety. Um, so different cultivars, yes, would have, because caffeine kind of goes with so many different factors such as the, uh, the size of the bud, the leaf, the uh, the harvesting times, things like that. So uh, different variety will al always have these uh, details different for each tea as well. So that kind of goes together with the caffeine. So every, yes, every different cultivar uh, depends on all these factors, uh, details that they have, they will also have uh, different caffeine. Oh, well, because uh, the number one enemy uh, is moisture for tea. Um, tea, in a way, um, if you do not care about desirability of taste, tea, in a way, can last for a really, really long time because it's a dry product. Um, but if moisture gets into tea, the tea can get rotten, uh, and the moisture, if, if it's just slightly damped, um, that the moisture alone can also cause the tea to uh, oxidize even in a more accelerated rate. And if you have too much moisture, it'll eventually grow mold, things like that. Uh, so yeah, moisture can completely alter the tea. It can make the tea taste funky, really bad. It can even be damaged to uh, your health. So, so condensation uh, is a much bigger problem than oxidation because oxidation is, um, how do I say, it's like, 
it's it's you know when uh it's it's it, when the tea tastes like a little bit less uh than optimal, but it doesn't really uh kind of hurt you. But condensation, if you don't manage it really well, it can be very damaging to the tea and it could possibly to the drinker as well. All right, uh, we only have forty two seconds left. So I think it's a good time to uh, finish. Oh, let me just uh, use this opportunity to type in the name of the varietal. For uh, the uh, heirloom varietal for uh, the tea that we just had. So I just typed it. It's uh, both with uh, simplified Chinese characters and it also with uh, the, um, uh, the pinyin as well. Yeah, it means stupid tea. <laughs> um, also, uh, make sure you can go to our website and then go to the uh, the, 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 the what page for Guapian. It has more details there.